Hello everyone. We are going to take a look at um, Chapter 11 uh, in your North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. Again, this PowerPoint um, was written uh, by Washington State, and I do want you to pay attention to the um, the acknowledgments at the end to give to give those guys credit. We're going to go ahead and get started. Again, they've switched around their chapters. Um, I did change it to chapter 11 here. They wrote it for the uh, the national pesticide applicator. And I've done just a few modifications for the North Carolina. So let's go ahead and get started. Emergency response. Uh, in this unit, you know, we're going to know how to implement and execute an emergency response plan. You're going to see the components of that plan. Uh, you know, things like, you know, drawing a map, having a list of your pesticides, having your MSDS sheets all available. Identify how unintended spills and fires uh, can harm humans and the environment. Um, you know, doing something by mistake, guys, it's still going to cause uh, damage, uh, can cause damage to the environment or even uh, people. And then understand how to clean up the spills uh, to reduce an environmental impact. There's certain ways that you're going to collect uh, the spilled pesticides, whether granular or liquid, and you're going to have to get rid of the tools that you use to, to clean it up with. And then know how to dispose of contaminated items. And then be familiar with emergency response equipment. All of those were your, I guess, learning objectives uh, for, uh, for, this, um, for this PowerPoint. But emergency response, you need to be prepared. Uh, us being the pesticide applicators, we have the responsibilities to uh, protect our employees, the community, the neighborhoods that we're working in, and the environment in general. You don't want to do anything that's going to harm neighbors, the pets uh, of your neighbors if you're applying pesticides. And, you know, who would actually want to hurt these little guys right here? Look at all these Labradors. I'm a big lab fan. But what is a typical emergency? An overturned vehicle. It could be as simple as the landscape truck with Roundup in the back. You know, a 50-gallon drum of Roundup uh, going to a large commercial site. That's, that's, that's a bad situation. Uh, a ruptured hose. I've seen it. You've probably seen it. You've been behind a lawn care truck or even a tractor if you live in rural America and you see liquids coming out of the tank. You know, it's either a ruptured hose uh, or dry rotted seal, but you're seeing liquid come out of that tank. Uh, explosion or fire in a storage area. And so why do we plan for an emergency response? Because we want to protect our employees, community, and the environment. How you respond will make all the difference in the world. Being prepared is going to help you uh, to respond to any of these situations. Develop your plan. Designate an emergency coordinator. It's probably going to be yourself, your small company. It's going to be the business owner. Uh, or it could, be your, um, it could be your office staff, your secretary. But you need to maintain a list of emergency response agencies. Person or agencies to be notified. Local emergency planning committee. Police and fire units, which I mean, typically it's going to be 911, paramedics and hospitals, chemical manufacturers, uh, contaminant and hazardous waste cleanup personnel. But you need to have a list somewhere that you can get to pretty quick um, in case you do have an accident. Uh, you know, whether it be programming it in your phone or keeping a notebook at the office, but you need to be able to get in touch with each and every one of these people. And an attorney. Hey, trust me, he's probably going to call you first if he's heard it on the news. Uh, you know, seeing your truck and you're a client of his, he's going to come knocking at your door. All right. Information to be included uh, in an emergency notification call. Um, keep this with that list of, of uh, um, names and numbers that you need. So when you call, you've got this information to give them. Name a reporting person. Eric Jones, date and location of the incident, July 13th, 2014. Description of incident. Um, spilt, um, shovel punctured, 50 gallon drum of Roundup in the back of my truck. Name of chemical, Roundup. Quantity was 50, uh, 50 gallon drum. Uh, classification, Roundup. The extent of injuries, you know, it's minor. And then potential effects on the environment community. Um, it was raining. The Roundup's 
running down a street without curb and gutter it's getting in people's shrub beds and lawns you know kind of information but that's the information you're going to want to give these people that you're going to call map your facility um, it's your storage facility of your pesticides so you got you got your storage facility you got a main utility shut off it's fenced in you do have road access and letting them know uh, direction of north is important You'll learn more about that in, in landscape design, trust me. But the map should include layout of storage areas or buildings and bulk storage tanks, access to roads and fences, main shutouts for utilities. You know, it's just, you know, turning the power off to your, to your building. Location of fire alarms, extinguishers, and protective clothing. And send updated copies of emergency response agencies whenever changes are made. May you decide to build a, an addition or you know you've taken the fire extinguisher out of the building and stored it over here in a new shed or something like that you need to let everybody know and let the emergency response teams know provide an area map too you know these guys need to know where you are i mean i live in poff town poff town's getting to be kind of a big area um turn off sword road and boom you know there we are but, you know, the shops behind the house, um, most of the landscape stuff, you can't even see from the road because the house is up front. I live beside my parents. Their house is up the front. And then we got all the farm and the barns and stuff in the back. So area map would actually help them get to where we're at. And then they're going to need an area map um, of how we've laid the farm out. But keep an inventory as well product names, volumes, and locations of where they're at. They all should be in your pesticide storage shed. But keep copies of the labels, MSDS, and protective equipment. Keep a set of documents away from the storage area, preferably uh, in your office. And then emergency equipment, tools for diking, trenching, pumping, and vacuuming in case of a spill. Containment and cleanup materials. And then fire extinguishers and PPE. All that needs um, needs to be kept up to date. You need to check it routinely, especially your PPE, your fire extinguishers, and then make sure you have enough tools so you can actually contain a liquid spill. That's why you want to dike it or trench it, or even you know if you could vacuum uh, some of the chemical up. Outline your actions. Plan step-by-step -step procedures according to each possible emergency, fire, spill, or leak, or transport accident. Designate responsible personnel uh, beforehand. Who's going to do that? They're going to already know that's part of their job description. They're, they're in control of taking care of this for you. And then write down everything that happens. Best thing to do is keep a little notebook with you in the truck, uh, you know, one in your front shirt pocket. I mean, you need to write stuff down. And share the outline with local responders again. Pesticide fires, how to avoid the fire. Nasty little little burn marks here in the guys. Assess the flammability and storage hazards of your pesticide products. Look on the label for do not use or store near heat or open flame. Again, common sense is going to tell me that. I'm not going to keep my pesticides next to an open flame. Uh, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to have a wood burning stove inside of my uh, pesticide shed. And then fires usually involve oils or petroleum solvents. Potential problems. Well, pesticides may give off highly toxic vapors or smoke. That's the biggest concern. Uh, they're going to harm the firefighters, so that's why they need to know what's in there. And then even nearby residents, animals, and plants. Um, it can get kind of nasty when, when you have these vapors in the air, guys. Residues may be present in debris and the soil. And then runoff from the fire site may be uh, highly toxic. Where the firefighters have put out the pesticide fire, now you've got all that water that's got the chemicals in it running off of your site. Take precautions to reduce fire hazards. Put storage facility far from people and animals, and only a select group of people need to have access to it. Always keep your storage locked. Um, you know, here they're using a the key. I recommend the combination lock. That way one or two people could have the combination. Yeah, if you have an employee that you've got to get rid of, you change the lock. But how many times have I been called back because I had the keys in my pocket? Or I had to call my dad because 
keys are in his pocket. If it's a combination lock and only one or two people, hey, Dad, what's the combination? I need to get in here. You know, doesn't have to spend all that time coming back. Um, and clearly post your warning signs. Uh, store combustibles away from uh, heat sources. Common sense. Do not store containers in sunlight, especially glass. Well, you know, it's if you use one of those little barns, like I told, from one of the big box stores. Uh, you know, they're going to be vented. They'll have a little window in it. You're not going to get much sunlight in it. You want to keep it shady and cool. Install fire alarms, and then keep foam type fire extinguishers approved uh, for chemical fires available. And then there's even companies, guys, that'll offer you the, the fire extinguishers. You know, you may need one for your, you definitely need one for your pesticide container storage. You know, you may have a shop that you work on your mowers or your other equipment, and then you probably have an office. You can rent these or, you know, pay a leasing fee. They'll actually come out, check them out, install them. I mean, you don't have to go and buy one, um, but they're going to come by and test them and make sure they're, they're good. And then you can tell them, hey, I'm keeping pesticides in here. I need a foam-type fire extinguisher. Notify the fire department of the location and contents of the storage facility. You've heard me say this in previous lectures, too. They need to know exactly what you have um, in your shed, in your storage shed. And develop an emergency plan and train the workers um, to execute it. And then keep an inventory of all pesticides in storage. And like I said, the less pesticides you have, the less chance you are going to have a fire. Buy the pesticides, use them. Don't buy in bulk. Yes, we buy fertilized in bulk. And fertilize is something that's dangerous when it comes to... Uh, to fires as well, but I just have fertilized stored up because you're using a lot, you know, we use quite a bit of fertilized, but our pesticides, we're buying it on a use by use basis, you know, buy enough for the week, buy enough for, you know, two weeks, don't buy enough for six months. Uh, if there is a chemical fire, evacuate the area, call 911 and tell what chemicals are involved, keep people away, establish a perimeter, uh, perimeter and and protect downwind you know you may uh, well if you had a greenhouse or something downwind you may want to try to seal it up you know close the doors turn off the vents um, you know do what you can to protect the downwind and then have MSDS notebook ready you know have all your MSDS is printed uh, I still like that printed version um, you know I keep some of them on my iPad Maybe keep some labels on my iPad, especially stuff that I use all the time. But having that notebook and just grabbing it, you know, your iPad might be dead. So, you know, keep that hard copy so you can have with you in case of an incident. If the fire is small, contain with fog, foam, or a dry powder. If only water is available, use as a fine spray or fog. Don't overwet. And then water jets can break bags and glass and may spread contamination. Especially when that material gets hot and you get that hard stream on it, it is going to shatter. And then contain the water and spilled chemicals. Your trenching tools, you know, dig a little moat around it. You want to contain it as best as possible. If the fire is large, consider withdrawing and letting it burn. Using water may lead to widespread contamination. And then build dikes to contain water if necessary. After the fire, clean or dispose of all clothing. Everyone involved should shower and do not clean up or salvage until the area uh, has cooled. Pesticide spills. Protect yourself and others. You know, always have your PPE and administer first aid. Different spills equals uh, different uh, different hazards. And as you can see here, you know, the truck overturn. Then you had the guys out here in the full chemical spacesuits. Uh, and what they're doing is they're cleaning that pesticide up and they're putting it in those white containers that they'll be able to dispose of. The three C's. Your book talks about the three C's. This is good information. We want to control the spill. We want to contain it. And then we want to clean it up. Then respond to the spill, which may be very small to very large. Controlling the spill. Always wear your PPE. First, stop the leak or spill. You're going to control it. If it's a matter of turning off the valve, this pesticide here container is leaking over on its side. Simple as wearing your PPE over there and turning it upright 
so it doesn't spill any more out. Just as I said, upright it so it no longer spills. Put smaller containers into larger containers. You know, those five gallon uh, buckets, uh, even those Rubbermaid Tupperware things, you can set that inside of that and it's going to contain it. And then try to plug larger leaks and get help. Uh, have a cell phone handy. Pretty much everybody carries a cell phone with them now. And then alert the police if the spill is on a highway. Alert other state agencies if pesticides are involved. Have the label and MSDS available for the responders. For large spills, send someone to get help. Do it right away, but do not leave the site unattended. You know, most of the time there's going to be somebody there. Um, you know, especially if it's on a highway. I mean, people, rubberneckers, they're always going to stop, look. So, you know, flag somebody down. Call for help. Go get me some help. I'm staying here. For major spills, call the state local emergency management office or Chemtrek, uh, you know, 800-424-9300, emergency only, and then emergency number on the label of the pesticide. All right, now we're going to control the spill. We want to keep people out. Set that buffer of 30 feet from the actual spill. Create that perimeter of 30. Avoid contact with drift and fumes. And do not use flares if spilled material is flammable. Common sense, right? You've got a pesticide that is highly flammable or combustible, and you set a flare right next to it. Common sense. And evacuate people from downwind areas. You know, just, you know, it's kind of going to be an inconvenience, but it's for their safety. You do not want the down, uh, downwind. You do not want to be downwind from some of these uh, pesticide guys. Contain the spill. Do everything possible uh, to prevent its spread. Build a dike or a dam. Um, you know, and see, this is a pretty good example. I mean, you know, here, yeah, that's that's a major pesticide spill here. But something like this that we're going to run into in in our horticulture careers. You know, there's they built a built a dike around the drain, so you know, a little bit still getting in there but not much. I mean, not as much uh, as it would have been if they hadn't built the, built the dam. The spill must not get into any body of water, including, including sewers and drains, which, I mean, he did get a little bit there. So he's going to probably have to pay um, a little hefty fine. Containing the spill again, if, water, uh, if a water body is contaminated, contact the appropriate state agencies immediately. Notify a lo local emergency uh, planning coordinator. And then do not delay downstream users must be notified quickly. So, makes sense, you know, possibly more if it's a creek or a stream, something like that. Um, sewer system, yeah, still, everybody does need to be notified. All right, when we have a spill, we're going to use an absorbent, uh, vermiculite. You know, we use that in, in the horticulture industry anyway. But even pet litter can actually absorb uh, absorb these uh, um, pesticides, even clay. I mean, if you don't have any of this stuff there, a shovel and some dirt will actually help absorb it. And it's easier to remove that contaminated soil than to let it just keep, you know, leaching down into the soil. And then you got to remove all that soil that's been leached through. Avoid using sawdust on strong oxidizers. Catch fire, guys. And then pillows, tubes, or pads offer an easy method but must be disposed of properly. <clears throat> May be able to apply at a labeled or lower rate, and there's no waste generated. Uh, containing dust, wettable powders, and granular spills. Um, lightly mist with water to contain because uh, you don't want that, that powder to like get up in the atmosphere and people breathe it in. So you're just kind of lightly missing it. Or you can cover it with a plastic, like a tarp or, or sheets of plastic to actually contain that dust particles. When cleaning up the spill, add absorbent material, sweep it up, and put into a lined drum. Use 30% bleach or hydrated lime to neutralize the area. And then use a coarse broom to uh, work into the area. Always wear your PPE. Do not use lime and bleach together, and then repeat as necessary. 
If the soil is contaminated, remove the top two to three inches of the soil, unless it's been sitting there for days and it's leached on down. Dispose of as a hazardous waste if you can't dilute it with clean soil and apply it to a labeled site. And what they're saying there, guys, is you can actually take contaminated soil. You know, it's really saturated with the pesticide. And you can mix it with clean soil, which is basically diluting it within the soil. And then you can take that diluted soil and spread it or use it in a, at a site that's labeled for that pesticide. So you're not actually, for one, you're not actually throwing it away. It doesn't need to be in the landfill. I mean, you're, you're doing right by the environment. You're actually, you're downgrading that pesticide, mixing in the clean soil, and then putting it on a site that would need the pesticide. And then cover it with two inches of lime and then a fresh topsoil. <coughs> Activated charcoal may be effective for minor spills. And then clean your contaminated equipment. Always wear your PPE. Use a 30% bleach and water or alkaline detergent and then do not mix the bleach uh, and detergent. Clean up. Discard of the brooms, shoes, and cloth hats. You need to get rid of them. Don't save disposables and highly contaminated clothing. And that's pretty much why I guess you see landscapers and people in horticulture. Um, we're not wearing the best of clothes when we go to work because we don't want to mess them up. Um, you know, not even dealing with pesticides, but just think about some of the work that we're going to do. As horticulture professionals, we don't want to wear our Sunday best out there. Well, when you're supplying pesticides, you may want to wear, you know, uh, the clothes you may not want to be caught caught in when you when you're going out to eat with your loved ones so you're gonna to have to throw some of these things away guys if you get contaminated wash yourself thoroughly with soap and water and then write down everything it's for your own legal protection the notebook in your truck you know in your pocket cameras take pictures make sure you document every everything um, keep records of activities during the emergency and conversations with regulatory authorities, emergent personnel, and general public. Good documentation is critical. Um, you know, record the conversation. You got to let them know that you're recording it, but record it if you have to. Um, take photographs. And for some of you younger people that maybe not know what this is, um, but that's a camera. And I know everybody's got the camera phones now, so. Um, you're pretty much going to have a camera with you at all times. But to capture it, you know, take pictures of the damage as well as you and your employees cleaning up the process because if this does go to court, you're going to need evidence, guys. Prevent spills first. Inspect and maintain your vehicles and equipment. Should be done. Um, you know, a clean truck, clean equipment. If you ever took marketing and management with me, um, and you've seen the uh, the 5S for landscapers. It's one of the big things keeping your vehicles clean, equipment clean. It helps in your productivity. And then understand your spray system thoroughly. Just don't buy it and start using it. You need to calibrate it. You need to practice just using water. You need to get the feel of it before you start applying pesticides. And be a safe driver. Keep a spill, a spill kit nearby whenever you're handling pesticides, including in storage areas and transport vehicles. You know, it's got some PP in there, uh, you know, probably some of those blankets, maybe a sheet of plastic or a tarp if it was a dust spill. You know, keep those things in there. Here it's going to tell us exactly what to include. For one, our emergency phone numbers, that list I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. <coughs> our PPE, absorbent materials, pillows, contaminant contaminant tubes, clay, sawdust, pet litter, activated charcoal, vermiculite. Well, it's kind of hard to get all of that in one of those little bags, but yeah, you could probably keep a small bag of, of, of kitty litter in there. Shovel, broom, dustpan, uh, sweeping compound. You know, we're landscape contractors, guys. We, we're, we're probably going to have uh, definitely a shovel and possibly a broom in there. I mean, that's just what we do when we clean up. And a fire extinguisher rated for, for many chemical fires. You need to have a fire extinguisher. If you're, if you're a mowing crew, you need to have that fire extinguisher. But then also a large, sturdy plastic drum. And a good idea with that spill kit, you know, we saw the picture in the bag, but if you had these plastic drums, you know, it's got a lid on it, you know, you could keep uh, some sawdust in there. You could 
keep a pillow. You could keep some kitty litter. You can actually get uh, you know a shorter broom, a dust pan. Um, all that would fit like in that that tub. So all you gotta do is grab that tub, throw it in the back of the truck, or keep it with you when you're spraying. And in summary, uh, develop an emergency plan uh, and thoroughly train all your employees in its details. Uh, I've always seen in my experience when we've hired new employees, we were so desperate for having extra help, we didn't significantly have a chance to train them. And this is something that they do need to be trained on, guys, especially when they're dealing with the pesticides, they're dealing with gas, uh, diesel fuel, any of that type of stuff. Train your employees. Some pesticides are highly flammable. Respond to the fires appropriately. Respond to pesticide spills with the three C's. Control, contain, and clean up. And prevention is the best solution. Being prepared, taking the time to inspect your vehicles, inspect your uh, spray equipment is going to be the best way to prevent uh, an emergency from happening. Keep the spill kits handy. And then, guys, here's the acknowledgments, you know, uh, that I wanted to uh, to let you guys know that, uh, you know, who developed this. And I hope that this helps clarify uh, emergency spills and fires. And I will see you guys in the next lecture.